Welcome to the Swim Swam podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today, I've got a very special guest. He is a three-time Olympian for Belarus. He's a, he's a world championships medalist, a European championships medalist, an NCAA All-American for Florida State. Today, we've got Pavel Senkovic. Pavel, how's it Hi, going, Paul. man? <laughs> Doing well. So let's start with the here and now you're, you're coaching at a swim meet. You were kind enough to take time out of, out of coaching at the 18 and under championships to sit down and talk with me. Um, tell me, tell me about coaching and how things have been, especially in the last few months with, you know, obviously this pandemic we're in. Well, with this meet, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty relaxed atmosphere. You know, the junior national is spread out in between different sites and they're allowing, um, features cut swimmers to participate as well so it's a lot more relaxed it feels like more like a, just a normal dual meet or <clears throat> just normal seasonal meet instead of uh, real like national level competitions or junior nationals uh in terms of pandemic well it's i've been busy <laughs> uh since uh, we got back we located at private school at mcclay school and uh i think we're back one of the probably first clubs in Florida back in the water. Uh, we started swimming one per lane in uh, April. But um, it's it, there has been some challenges in terms of managing the team because everybody's so spread out. So basically instead of regular like two or three hours or wherever uh, coaches spend on deck, we have all groups spread out throughout the day. So, so And some coaches didn't want to uh, – risk it and come back right away because you know there's circumstances where kind of unknown so uh on my end i've been i've been busier than ever this year uh but but last couple of months were a lot more relaxed than where we started in april nice now that's yeah that seems good it seems like things have gotten better in april since april at least in terms of um things being able to open up and people being able to operate um so, which is it's, it's it's weird times we're in man um Unless we have some knowledge about you know how we should behave to um keep it keep it low keep it down the cases yeah certainly which uh, yeah seems very helpful um also of of <laughs> news in your life you just had uh, a baby which is yeah. child number two. Um, I mean, I know nothing about fatherhood. I don't. I don't have children. But how, does does what what impact has has a second child made in the week that you've had it? Well, uh, you kind of learn how to operate sleepless, and uh, whenever you have like four, five, six, four plus hours of sleep, it, it feels like you're fully recovered already. <laughs> Uh, so it just, yeah, certain adjustments that you get used to, um, but it's nothing unmanageable. And obviously it brings a lot of happiness to um, life of the family, entire family. My, my grandfather is visiting right now. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of joy for him as well. That's, that's super cool. Uh, congratulations. Is it a boy or a girl? Uh, second is a girl. First one was boy. Okay, nice. Um, well, yeah, again, congratulations. That's, that's super cool. Um, I mean, I, so I brought you on here because you've been, a, you've been on the scene for, for a long, yeah. long time. Um, you, you were pretty prolific in the sport, certainly for Belarus, you know, you were part of this kind of uprising, um, for swimming in Belarus. And so, um, it's, I, I'd like to talk to you about some, just some of the history there, your upbringing in the sport, Obviously, you were in the NCAA as well. So um, I'd like to start just with your start in the sport. Um, how did you become interested or uh, invested in swimming? Well, I started probably, probably like a lot of um, younger swimmers start. I came to the pool with my friend. And uh, I remember that I didn't like it at all for some period of time. And then it kind of... Um, 
it, it was easy for me to learn to swim, but I didn't enjoy it right away. And after some short period of time, we had a first swim meet where I didn't know how to act, but I've done pretty well times. I even remember those like 20, 22 seconds, 25 freestyle, and like 25 seconds, I think in 25 meters pool, uh, 25 back shoot. But the coach told me that all I need to do, because I was new, she told me that I need to try to swim with a beautiful technique, long stroke, and that's it. <laughs> I had no idea that I was supposed to race. So when I came not, not the first one to the wall, I was kind of upset because I didn't try. I was just, I didn't know <laughs> that you ranked by time. I thought, it, no, look at us and you know how beautiful your technique is. Uh, but yeah, I, I came to the pool with a friend and um, that's how it started. Uh, I had two coaches at the very beginning and then the guy, um, he was kind of picking up faster swimmers as they were getting older. Uh, it's just how it works in, in their duo. Um, the lady, my first coach and, and, and the guy. And uh, I, was, I was with him until I left uh, for, uh, for U.S. So mm. I, I had the same coach. And um, yeah, if, if you talk about an international scene, um, I started also relatively early. We had our European level competitions when I was 15. So in 2005 and uh, yeah, 2006, I was participating in already in um, not junior, but regular European championships. And uh, 2007, I was at Worlds uh, in Melbourne. Yeah. Whoa. I, d I did not realize that. That's I was I was not that fast then, but I was making I, I was relatively fast for short course. Um, my long course was always a little bit behind. And uh, I was there because we qualified as a relay. I also was swimming individual events, but I, if I remember correctly, qualifying criteria was a little bit different back then. Um, so yeah, we made it as a relay and that was, that was my main event. Yeah. Uh, was there a moment, you know, in those younger teenage years where you kind of realized the, the aha moment of, oh, I, I really want to invest in this or just, oh, I could be pretty good at this. I, I think uh, the philosophy of uh, just approaching sport is different, uh, especially in Eastern, Eastern Europe mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in Western world. A lot of kids see sport as a good opportunity to uh, Well, maybe not a good opportunity, but just a good investment and uh, of their lifetime, you know, and uh, they start from the very childhood already with a thought that they're going to be professional in this, in like what they do. Often when you talk to Eastern European and you're going to ask them, like, how long was your professional career? And are they going to mention the time period from the time they started training? They're not going to say when they like made national team or when they start getting paid which is the case in US, as you know, uh, they can just say like, you know, I had like 23 years, uh, 23 years of professional career because I started swimming when I was seven. Yeah. So they're going to answer something like that. And uh, I think that they're just uh, a little bit of a difference. So I never thought of like, just starting being professional, just from very young age. I just, you know, knew that that's what I'm going to do after probably a couple of years maybe when i was like 10 but very early and uh yeah i guess it started very early interesting and I, so then you know like you said 15 you're going to european junior meets 16 you're going to european championships 17 you go to world championships was though i mean it seems like you kind of climbed the ranks it's not like you started with an olympics or you're you know you started on on a, on a huge stage you kind of built up to it it seems to those big international stages was yeah. there was there a meet in particular that was a really helpful learning experience for you in those earlier years yeah i think in general 2006 on the beginning of 2007 uh maybe realize a lot of things because um well, I, I'll start a little bit before that. So for a long time, I believed even watching like Popov and Ian Thorpe and 
all these swimmers. They obviously were wearing suits. Well, Popov didn't really, but Thorpe did. And, you know, at the time, like beginning of 2000, a lot of people already used like full body, not full body, almost most like legs, all legs yeah. kind of suits. But I, for a long time, believed that I'm going to be the one never shaving, never wearing a swim cap, and I'm going to erase, erase in my Speedos because, you know, that's a fair way of like doing things. <laughs> I, I thought that, um, you know, wherever body is, you're given, that should be the competitions. You know, mm -hmm. you, with all the advantages or disadvantages, it just how it should be. Uh, by the way, and we can also get into a topic of suits based on this discussion. But yeah, so in 2005, I, um, I used suit for the first time, you know, coaches, not my coach, by the way, but uh, some other team coaches convinced me to try to use uh, arena, like lower body suit. And I went from 57 in short course to 54. I never went 56, 55, never, ever. I just went to 54 <laughs> right away. And every meet I was dropping time. So in a matter of, I think, like six months, I went basically from 57 to 52.9 at European Championships, <laughs> which was just, you know, I, it was great, obviously. It felt good. <laughs> yeah. But it made me kind of be mad about these suits even more. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, and from that year, like end of 2005 and 2006, I was included in last moment i was included uh to go to short course european championships and uh then in march of 2007 there were uh 2007 worlds it was awkward timing because it's australia you know so it's it's all different <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> um but yeah this period of time was kind of the moment of uh, i i cannot pick one single meet i guess it's europeans uh, in 2005, I do not remember the name of the meet. It was like junior meets, guys under 18, I think. And I was only, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, I think 14, 15, 16 guys and 11, 12, 13 girls, something like that. But yeah, European meet for really young swimmers, not junior European championships. Gotcha. And then 2006 Europeans and then 2007 Worlds, these three meets kind of, um, made me think a lot more seriously about my future in this sport and uh, kind of, well, it was overall a great experience. We spent one month in Australia, so overall it was uh, just eye opening in, in many, many cases, many, many, uh, well, yeah, I guess I phrase it like I phrase it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so let's, let's, let's get into the suits then. 2008 you go to your first olympic games and obviously these are the games where uh, not only michael phelps wins eight gold medals but every world records are toppling left and right because you have the introduction of these super suits um so tell me tell me about that experience for you well i think 2008 olympics in general um unbeatable experience for a lot of swimmers not only for me for me it was definitely a the one out of my entire career, I'm probably going to pick this Olympic Games uh, and just uh, atmosphere as a whole as the best experience like ever. <laughs> uh, they just made incredible job in terms of how the village was set up and uh, how open everything and uh, was and uh, the, the um, opening ceremony. That's the only opening ceremony I went to. Uh, so that was just really great experience as well. I wouldn't go there every time because you didn't see a lot of stuff. It's not like you sitting on the stands and just watch the show. You just, yeah. you know, inside for a long period of time. But in Beijing, that was great. Um, well, and uh, I mean, watching competitions, yeah, it was uh, pretty rich in terms of world records and just high level results. And obviously watching the best ever performance out of any sport, which was Michael Phelps winning eight medals and just, uh, yeah, unbelievable, unbelievable races like a uh, hunt fly and, uh, the U S versus France relay. 
and uh, Lisa are still done. It's like I'm Michael Phelps touch, I can kind of understand that. But like how Lisa sat on the way for <laughs> for like 75 meters <laughs> and then just cut up with very, very low stroke count, stroke count uh, not stroke count, stroke rate, sorry, at the, mm -hmm. at the very end, but staying so powerful at the end of the race. Yeah, that was just a very, a very impressive experience as a whole. Yeah. And it's, I mean, had, had the suits grown on you at that time? I mean, let's get into that topic. Oh yeah. We're talking about, I love talking about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. So at the time, ex well, I wouldn't speak for everybody, but me, I personally didn't realize that like jacket and or jacked, however you pronounce it mm -hmm. and arena. Uh, so the material so different from speed one. Mm -hmm. I thought it's all like fast suits. Um, I don't know, I remember what I was wearing. I think I was wearing a speedo, but I'm pretty sure uh, we had at the time contract with Rena. But uh, since all the suits are coming out, uh, some of the top swimmers like decided to try something else, and uh, we didn't have a contract after that. <laughs> but uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but yeah, it was it was just interesting experience, but at the same time a little bit hectic uh because for, for our team we didn't have a chance to try the suit that uh we would wear ahead of time so i remember at the olympics you would just like try one suit try another suit and try to decide on a suit and uh there were no leader who would just suggest us like right now as a coach i would just tell swimmers like do not worry about it and just use what you always use and just you know, it's, it's, it's not the, it's not the suit that's going to swim for you. Just like, forget about trying new suits. If it's like a little bit faster, so be it, you're going to race in a little bit slower suit, but you're going to feel comfortable. You're going to say, save yourself all the nerves and just, you know, no point of doing that. But at the time we we're like running around and like trying to find the best suit and <laughs> trying the suits. And yeah, it was a little bit messy. Uh, but I was always also wearing the lower power body suit. So I didn't like, I didn't, yeah, I, I, I think I can say that I didn't feel anything like very, very special that it changes your body position compared to the previously textile suits, like a lot. Uh, it was definitely a little bit more compression, but I was also never the one who wanted more compression. I feel, you know, I feel comfortable with a suit a little bit uh, larger than I can fit in. And, uh, so yeah, for me, it was in the moment of realization that this is like super cars that we use for swimming. It wasn't anything like that. It was just a uh, interesting experience because so many new things, so many new models were coming out, uh, so many new brands. So for the sport as a whole, I think it was exciting. Uh, for the swimmers, um, a little bit hectic. If you didn't have a chance to try suits like we didn't, um, but yeah, definitely, definitely not the experience we have right now. <laughs> it's certainly, certainly a different ball game now. I mean, yeah. and then that, you know, that the suits steamroll into 2009 world championships. Were you at that meet as well? Yeah, I was at that meet. I dropped a lot of time. <laughs> I tried, I, well, I didn't try for the first time. I first time in my life figured out how to properly wear that suit because mm -hmm. that was for a long time. It was also like, uh, you know, you had to figure it out how to properly wear this suit. They, it, it wouldn't, this like kind of rubber material wouldn't let uh, air and water out as easily as textile would. So if you get it inside, uh, which was the case for boys all the time and for girls on their back, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it wouldn't feel right. And you wouldn't get the same experience, the same speed. So I only then figured out that you have to pull it over the bones and uh, kind of tied closer to your belly button. And then it works properly. And yeah, it felt amazing. It, like underwater, I was always really great in underwater. I, you know, probably under the radar because I never was like very, very close to world record. Well, I was like less than two seconds, but still relative. I'm talking about like the highest level, not about, you know, national level uh of of belarus uh 
Yeah, I was I was great in underwaters, but these suits felt like you you just flying. You were tell you needed less kick to kick to fifteen, or you had to hold insane tempo to feed this number of kick. It I mean it felt fast, and it definitely was like very different from what we had before. And uh, just to to. Uh, for you, for you, easier to imagine what I went from and to. I went from swimming, unshaved, wear, no cap, with longer hair, <laughs> uh, wearing speedos at first ever junior world championship in 2006 in Brazil. Mm-hmm. I was racing the final, and I was fourth. Even would probably wear a suit and shave. I would at least get a medal of some sort. Yeah. <laughs> but I, at 16, I still believe that you know we shouldn't do that. <laughs> Uh, and it went from that in three years to like wearing cap and shaving and like wearing this like super, super fast suit. So it was, yeah, completely two, two completely different games. <laughs> yeah. Full 180 for sure. Yeah. Um, that's pretty funny though. And so, so, so then the suits get banned and, uh, yeah, man, yeah. How, how did you feel about, you know, swimming then? Because, I'm sure everyone had an opinion of whether the suits should have stayed or left or, or you know, whatever. How, how'd you feel about that? I struggled for a lot for a while. So for me in particular, uh, I kind of got comfortable, I guess, with the suits. And uh, after they get banned, I just couldn't lay higher on the surface. And I was struggling with that for a while. I was just like swimming deep. And uh, yeah, it was uh, a little bit stagnant for a certain period of time. Uh, by then I finally found my food and it was it was all right. It just, my opinion on that topic is basically if we have just textile, what do we have right now? We try, we're kind of trying to give everybody just uh, here's the racing car, right? But you cannot adjust the seat. The seat is the same for everybody. So we have long arms, we have short legs, you're in a little bit of disadvantage. Uh, Instead, we can all use textile, but it could be like, you know, long, um, like a pen style swimsuit still. For uh, me in particular, that'd be great because I have giant calves. So I could use a little bit of compression there. Uh, for somebody with like flat body, uh, it's obviously not a big of a difference for some more muscular guy, like a sprint, like let's say Floor Manadu, I think he would benefit a lot more than uh, like Caleb Dressel from wearing a fast suit because it just, it's just how it works. You know, <laughs> you, you have more compression, you like smaller, lay higher. It's, yeah. So it's, it's, it's interesting, but I would like to have certain material suits. So the same textile, what we originally had when, you know, when it started like early 2000 uh, and just uh, let swimmers choose what's comfortable for, for them. Interesting. We, did you, did you see the, the Caleb Dressel swam, you know, 50 short course meter freestyle and tried to break yeah. 20 seconds in the bodysuit? I uh, saw that. I was a little bit upset. <laughs> <laughs> what, that he didn't break 20? Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I'm still sure that I'm 100% sure that it shouldn't be even a question if he can ma- do it. Like, right. it, like 100%, like 150%, he can do it. It just like he wasn't tapered, he wasn't rested. And, uh, you know, my idea w- was that he actually going to rest for that. Like, it's a big deal. But yeah. when I figured that it wasn't, I was like, like, why? <laughs> Why I was even waiting for that? That's you know just uh, just a kind of training video. Basically, it's exciting for the brand, for the speedo, but uh, and maybe for uh, just uh, casual swing fans, it's also like exciting. Uh, but for me, it was like <laughs> the 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 end of it was kind of like why <laughs> you know why <laughs> you made me watch that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think- it was, yeah, a little bit exciting for me, but the fact that it's possible, there is no doubt. Like, doesn't matter the brand, Speedo, Arena, uh, Jacket. It's it's easier under twenty, and I, I don't think only for Dressel in a fast suit. 
I think a few people would be able to do that. The, I think you echoed 90 nine percent of swim fans feelings about that event you know everyone was expecting a little more rest uh we you know i think um we can we can express a little anger with greg troy making him do 70k the week before (laughs) but uh but i think it was cool and that maybe we'll start seeing more things like this pop up and you know you'll have suit challenges, or the or the super suits will come back in some fashion, and it'll just be a meet where you know everyone puts on fast suits and just let's see how we can do it, and they get a three day rest or something like that. And I think that would be pretty sweet, and uh, you know, in 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 certainly engaging for some fans. I I really like the idea that uh, I believe if I pronounce the name correct, it's. Frederick Busquet uh, mm-hmm. from France mm-hmm. uh, that he pinched the idea that, you know, with those suits, it was more exciting for the companies to try to race and make the fastest suit, make the fastest suit. And also if they would allow to put different brand logos, you know, definitely would uh, bring us closer to those like supercars type of racing. And for the sport as a whole, it may be, you know, there is a chance it could be a lot better and a lot more exciting for the fans. Uh, now, obviously, you know, like uh, people more familiar with swimming and in charge of making this decision have to be really, really careful about making those decisions because we may end up where uh, swimmers not going to look like swimmers, but like uh, power lifters because they can fit in this tight suit and float without doing much. Yeah. And, you know, the strongest swimmer would win. Uh, so we definitely don't want that. But it's a, a little bit of unknown territory because we never went there. Uh, but I would definitely like to see a little bit more marketing allowed on the suits and uh, just kind of bringing more of this uh, professional in terms of, uh, making money for the swimmers, more, more of these professional type of contracts and deals and like even dressel challenge, not so 20 challenge, um, more, more of that in, in swimming. Yeah. And I think that was one of the coolest parts about it is that, you know, everyone was like, this is basically just an infomercial for speedo. And yes, it was, but it was a cool event. And, and, you know, he exemplified that Dressel had the suit and it had like huge speedo logo. It had Dressel down one leg and it had like sub 20 down the other leg. And, you know, he had all these huge logos on his suit and it's like, he looked like a race car. (laughs) That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. That's exciting to see. Definitely. Yeah. So, sorry. We, so, so that's our suit conversation. Um, let's get back on track. So, you know, it takes you a while to adjust to not having the suits. And is that around the time that you came to Florida state? No, that was, I came to Florida state in 2013. And I think I started okay. having thoughts about trying to go to United States and, you know, train there for some period of time, hmm. uh, in, uh, 2008. I would just kind of, I was always, I always wanted to swim 200 really well. And for me, my entire career, it was just a kind of trying to survive race. I was basically having so much, too much speed for what I was showing in the first half. But I knew that if I just uh, go out, it's, you know, it's not going to go well on the second half. Uh, So it was kind of, Maybe just how I felt, uh, but I always wanted to swim 200 with a more relaxed mind and more prepared body. Uh, and we're trying with my coach to do that. But at some point, he just told me, you know, I just, you know, that's how I coach and I coach sprint. Uh, and it's kind of sad that I'm leaning into and, uh, yeah, so I, I started trying different things with him already. Uh, but I still had this idea 
of uh, trying something new. And at the time, I was thinking more about the uh, like Alex Popov, for example, when they went to Australia. He went with the, his coach, so for him it was different. But uh, uh, that was the the um, original picture in my head uh, where I'm gonna go and how I'm gonna train there. It was like nothing like that at all. And I had a completely different experience that I didn't plan to have. Uh, but, you know, that was uh, the starting point for my trip to the United States. So le- I know you said Popov was the example. Did you end up going to Australia or that you just followed in his footsteps in terms of leaving the country to go train somewhere else? No, not even leaving the country to have uh, to have different experience. Because, you know, it's uh, at least in my childhood, we talk with uh, my coaches and my friends. We talk about like different style of coaching and different styles of training. And I read how like Australians study, you studied like, you know, Pablo trained and how uh, Tureski used to coach uh, Australian team and uh you know, these different philosophies of like high volume or whatever the, the, uh, the per- particular style of wherever the particular style of train is. And I wanted to experience for myself specifically the, you know, some typical American kind of style of training, mm-hmm. uh, a little bit harder sets and a little bit more brutal training and uh, a little bit more people in training i used to train by myself pretty much all the time for the main sets uh at least when i started being like more competitive uh when i was a kid i had someone somebody to race but like 18 plus i was pretty much racing myself like entire time and so so you end up in america and do you did you get that experience Uh, like i said i i got well, no, no. <laughs> to answer the question, yes, no, no, probably more than yes. Uh, I, it was not what I expected and what I planned, but when I got to yes, I kind of accepted that it could be not exactly what I expected, uh, but I'm going to try and go with that anyway. Now, with, with Florida State, it was also a little bit messy with coaches because I had like two and a half, or you can say like three coaches uh, during my very short period of time there. So it's definitely not what I used to swimming with one coach my entire career and just getting to know the program, getting to, um, get, getting to know my body within this program. Yes. I, I certainly believe that coach is not, not the person who knows all the answers, but it's the person who may make you realize more about your swimming even if something he doesn't know may make you deep dig deeper into that topic and get to know more about this topic so it doesn't matter how you figure out the things uh if the coach tells you the answer or if it tells you like i can't help you with that uh the the point that you get in better with the help of that person and how could could be in different forms and so, I mean, t- take me through your time at Florida State a little bit and just, you said more no than yes in terms of, did you get what you expect? What did you end up gaining from that time at Florida State or, or walking away with? Well, I definitely learned the language. That's the first thing. <laughs> nice. Uh, so that was a success kind of <laughs> 80% still working my vocabulary. <laughs> Probably would still continue working my, my, all my life. Uh, but yeah, on a serious note, um, can, can, can you repeat the question? I'm uh, having too yeah. much fun. No worries. What did you end up gaining from that experience at Florida State, whether it met your expectations or not? Well, I definitely got the experience of being a part of the bigger team and participating in dual meets and uh, having faster people to race in season. Uh, 
And for the majority of my time there, I think I still got the this experience that uh, I was expecting. It was just not consistent and not for long enough period of time uh, and maybe not the same quality that I wanted to. But partially it was, you know, what I what I wanted. I wanted a U.S. coach with not, not like somebody who came from Europe to coach here, but like who somebody has somebody who grew up uh, training under uh, another U.S. coach and kind of this uh, typical U.S. Well, typical, I say, obviously, there is really wide range of coaches with different understanding of, you know, how swimmers are supposed to training. But I'm probably talking more about like stereotypes that we have in Europe about training U.S. Uh, so a little bit higher in volume, uh, kind of more focus on racing your teammates, um, this, this type of training. And partially a, a little bit more brutal um, in terms of uh, how, you, how you push yourself on a daily basis. Uh, so I, I definitely got that. And uh, more than ever, I think it maybe made me, made me realize a lot of things in terms of how I want to approach my training and uh, what events I should or should not swim. Uh, tell me more about that. What, what, how, how did you find that you should approach your training and what events did you not want to swim or want to swim? Well, high volume, uh, high volume training is definitely, uh, and high volume, I'm talking probably about like, you know, 60 K plus, mm. uh, like 60 K a week for a pro swimmer. It's not, not how, how high volume, like, by the way, uh, when you are blaming Greg Troy for 70 K a week, it maybe his 70 K that's an easy week. <laughs> <laughs> maybe he did pay for Caleb a little bit <laughs> so he can me <laughs> down to 70k <laughs> there's your rest Caleb uh, <laughs> yeah so uh, um, yeah high volume training is beneficial at some period of time but it's definitely not the type of training I would like to have uh, all the time and I tried it with my coach in 2008 I was I performed really great at 2008 Olympics, but as a you know youngster, I was still not satisfied. Like probably for, for the majority of my career, I was not satisfied with my results. And uh, we decided to do a little bit more volume. So I was swimming at the time closer to 90K uh, per week. And we had long course, all long course, 11, 11 workouts a week, all long course. Uh, and we done like also a lot of court. So when we had the court workout, the workout was like three plus hours. It was just, you know, just so much time at the pool. And, uh, but it wasn't really like brutal, brutal in, time, in terms of main sets. We basically done like really big warm up and really big warm down. Main sets stayed more or less around like two or three, maybe K. Okay. Uh, but we had, uh, and, well, I probably should mention that back home, we didn't train most of, we didn't train most of the time, um, uh, like at home where, where you live, where you have your apartment, your house, uh, we would go to a training camp. So all you do is training hmm. and we had like five kind of joint training camps, five camps together, 20, 21 day each. So for this, like five camps, like a little bit, I think that was a little bit less than four months. I was doing that. I was doing like high volume, like 80 to 90 K close to 90, uh, for a, for a week. Uh, -huh. uh, and, uh, I didn't get, you know, I didn't get the results. I wanted at all. I was just, uh, always tired, always <laughs> like complaining. I, I was the swimmer that liked to complain. I was not the swimmer that would, um, skip something or would, uh, not put the effort I should. I was always living in the pool, um, like no 100%. I was the hardest working uh, swimmer in the pool. Uh, otherwise, you know, I, I, yeah, I don't know how other how the other way of training. I just that for me that was always the case. I was always 100% sure, like no doubts whatsoever, that I've done my best today. Mm -hmm. 
but I was also always the one who would just complain about it all the time, like how tired I am, how my legs hurt and how like my tricep, I cannot extend it. And, you know, all of that. It just, I don't know. It felt good <laughs> to complain to somebody. Uh, so this high volume type of training, um, you know, it's, it's not me. And, um, uh, yeah, we're talking like really high volume about the events. Uh, well, it's, it kind of made me realize the type of train I need to do to swim 200. And, uh, that even if I do that, I probably not going to be as good in 200 as I can be for the hundred. And that's, I'm talking only a long course right now. Uh, so it, it kind of made me broaden my focus back to a hundreds and it was always the focus. It just, you know, I always dreamed of 200, <laughs> uh, and it kind of brought the real focus back to a hundred and for sure course, I mean, it's, it's like, it's it's a different it's a, a very different from of course it's different racing and specifically yards like 200 yards is uh like true sprint event like sprinters can swim really really well in yards 200 <laughs> so yeah 200 yards that's probably that's my dream event that's <laughs> you know what we should race at the olympics <laughs> yeah I, I would love to see a 200 yard olympics that'd be sweet um, but yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you, you know, it's like 200 yards is truly, you know, a, a long sprint event and for me as an underwater kicker, you know, it was always great and joyful <laughs> just to, uh, you know, do the underwater and just chill on the surface, wait for people to catch up and like do underwater again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that seems pretty great. Um, <clears throat> so, so you, you get this experience in the U S and you, you get this other style of training. Um, I mean, did that pretty much take you up to, to 2017 when you took that break from racing? Well, no, um, it kinda in 2016, uh, for whatever reasons, uh, I don't think it's important for whatever reason, the coach. Uh, the, the Florida State decided to switch the coach. And uh, it was at the time, I believe that was like five months before Olympics. Uh, and to me, that was like, you know, like what I do. And at the time, my wife was also preparing for the Olympics and uh, we were split. She was preparing for, uh, for Olympics, like doing different train camps uh, back home and like in France, high altitude train camps and just being with the national team. And I, I decided in, I decided to stay in us, but then, you know, I didn't have a coach. So it was just a very massive preparation after 2015, which was, um, probably my best shape ever for long course. And, uh, it's, it, it was the biggest problem I faced. And I didn't realize that at the time that I had absolutely no one who would just advise me uh, that the best case scenario in this situation is to stick to what I was doing because, you know, because the previous season was your best season ever. So just like, don't change anything. And I started experimenting. Uh, I tried training with assistant coach and uh, it didn't go, you know, like I wanted to, I didn't feel right. I didn't, I didn't feel right. And my day, my training didn't go as planned. And, uh, I decided to train by myself and, you know, I kept experimenting and it was like all right before the Olympics. And I just sucked for Olympics. Uh, it was just a really bad, like really bad race. And it just, I got hit by a truck, you know, I was just like destroyed emotionally, just, you know, it was terrible. And, um, so that was the point basically when I was like, you know, I'm done because before that, like literally before Olympics, my thoughts were like, I'm swimming until I'm like 40, <laughs> I'm swimming forever. You know, that's what yeah. I do. <laughs> Let my legs can walk. I'm swimming. Uh, but 
you know, the Olympic experience changed a lot of things. And it was just, yeah, really, really heavy emotionally. And uh, I still was scheduled to race World Cups. And I don't think I even, no, I did. I did. Yeah, I was very disciplined swimmer. So I did get for warm down after my terrible race and I warmed down properly. So I've done the warm. I want to say that I never got in before the World Cups, but I did. Yeah, I done this warm down. But after this, long warm down i you know i did i was not getting into the pool up to next competition next competition went great uh well partially because it was short course and you know i was always uh better at short course and uh, i was still not training really i i was probably swimming like two or three times a week for the next two years and uh, i was still competing so that was another kind of opening uh, realization, big moment of realization, what you can do and how fast you can swim with the, um, with the train I've done pro previously. Uh, for, you know, for a long period of time, I was not doing much at all, uh, just kind of main maintaining and being depressed. <laughs> uh, but the results were great. You know, they didn't make me happy, but the competing went well. So that was very surprising. But yeah, if, if we're talking about the break, when I decided to take a break, I was done training in 2016. I was still competing, but in my head, I was like done. I was just kind of floating uh, because the stream was taking me there, <laughs> but I was not really focused on swimming anymore and uh yeah it was kind of weird because yeah i my 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 competition was going really well world cups went well i won my only uh world championship medal which i was, which I was like extremely happy about it uh and yeah 2016 and 17 in general was a great experience in terms of uh competing but it's it's really weird weird experience because that's where I didn't want to compete. And that's where I mentally was already like not a part of the swim world. So it was, yeah, a little bit unusual. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that is unusual. And I mean, did, did taking a step away from the sport help that mentality help with you, yeah. you know, yeah. feeling better about it? A lot. Yeah. I can, I can train in that. I, for a long period of time, I, it was really hard to get in the pool. I was just lifting and do nothing else uh, in terms of like physical, physical activity. Uh, yeah, it was, it was really hard mentally to, uh, to get over it, uh, and to kind of adjust or adapt, but that's, that's a separate topic. I, was thinking about it a lot and my wife she's always uh she was always interested in psychology and always reading books uh, on different topics and uh she advises me a lot on certain things and uh just recommends me certain articles to read or you know certain like instagram posts to uh to pay attention to uh and i started getting also a little bit deeper into into my, myself and slowly but surely i kind of sorted it out in my own head how it should work and you know who i am i as a person because for a long time i saw myself just as a swimmer partially because from the very young age that what i was told that you know if if you're serious about this you shouldn't do anything else. I was like skateboarding for a lot, for a long period of time and doing just active sports, you know, like bike and skateboard. That was my main two. Um, and because coach didn't want me to get injured at the time, I was like th maybe 14, 15. Like at the time, if you get injured, even if you like break your arm, like what's going to happen? You don't have like Olympics in front of you. Like literally nothing's going to happen. Just have fun, you know, do it. And it's not like it's 100% is going to happen. It's just a uh, you know, weird thought to have to expect an injury that's going to lead you to missing a lot of time at the pool. But for me back then, you know, I, I quit doing those two sports, 
which was uh, nothing else. It should be a range of things that you're supposed to do and uh, you, you want to do. And also, you pre preferably, preferably, you should realize that it's not everything you are. And for me, that was not the case. I, I feel like it's very easy for, for athletes, certainly for swimmers, to get wrapped up in that identity of, oh, I'm a swimmer, and that's, you know, that's, that is who I am. That is yeah. what I do. That, that's what I do, and therefore, that's who I am. Um, and, so, and it takes, like you said, it, it can take a long time and a long time away from the pool to wrap your brain around, oh, I'm actually other things, too. The, the phrase my first coach used and it was like i was eight nine and ten at the time she used to say like rough translation would be you should try try that hard that blood runs from your nose you know and that's kids who eight nine and ten years old and that's an idea i was you know uh training with well for a long period of time probably for the next 10 years at least so of course there would be like no doubt after after your coach demand that from you and uh you know like i said i was a disciplined child at least in the pool uh you just there was no way for me i would slack in practice you just i don't know i never had that o obviously not after 2016 i was already done i do not count this period of s training i was done <laughs> yeah. training yeah, yeah, that was not me, uh, you know, before uh, 2016. But up until that period of time, it just it sounded like my train would always go well. I had like great days. I had not so great days. It was mm -hmm. always hard for me to swim fast with uh, heavy lifting. Uh, but I was always 100 percent sure that, you know, this was this is my best. And uh, I was also uh, swimming pretty fast in in practice most of the time you know i was i was able to show some some impressive speed in practice yeah and <clears throat> i mean so you get through this transition you, you take the break you're you're able to ease back into swimming now yeah and you know to to bring this conversation full circle what tell me where you're at today in terms of your swimming if if you have goals moving forward and and what that looks like well, I'm 30 today, right now. <laughs> I have two kids, so I'm full-time coaching. And uh, I was talking to somebody recently. I forgot who that was, but it's, I don't think, I, I can't think of any examples where uh, a person was successfully combining full-time coaches with being a pro athlete. Um, so I'm not sure how that's going to go, but my plans is to compete in near future at a high level meet either you know world cup circuit isl olympic games or world championships and uh with circuits like sl and world cups it's a lot harder because it takes chunk of your time that you should be away from your family and from your swimmers so that's very very challenging to pull off successfully uh, at least on one side, you know, on side of coaching. Uh, so for me, it most likely like high level me, obviously if I qualify, because now I have to just show my times again. I don't have, I cannot even enter many meets because I don't have times from like two years, uh, past two years. So I have to race again. I actually raced at some small meet in town recently. I just uh, was doing like kind of back and rest just to have a qualifying time for senior champs. And those senior chaps got canceled. That was in March because I was telling you I was supposed to come back. So I was taking myself through paces and wanted to race at senior champs with my swimmers when I have a breaststroke or so. I was supposed to swim breaststroke for the relay. Nice. And I would go like 100 fly just so I have a qualifying time. <laughs> and in May, I was supposed to race at a bigger meet. So I, I guess I'm still on my way there. I kind of stopped training recently because of COVID, because I was extremely busy. Uh, so in the future, hopefully I'm going to race again. Uh, not a lot, just a very limited amount of time. Uh, going to be picky about the meets. 
Uh, and in terms of coaching, well, I have my own swim club and I'm probably going to keep doing that. Um, I mean, family, that's that's always a prior, priority. Um, so, yeah, I mean, right now I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy. I have a seven days old, so <laughs> <laughs> no, not seven right now. So already how many? Already 10. She's 10 days today. <laughs> awesome uh well pavel i i appreciate you taking the time to sit down and talk with me it's it's been cool chatting it up and, and swim nerding it up about all kinds of stuff um any parting thoughts before we sign off today we didn't touch on so many topics yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm that's i'm gonna have to bring you back we're gonna have to bring you back because you're you're right there's so many other topics we can we can broach on and touch on and uh, just like any technical aspects that <laughs> you know, pretty interesting. but yeah i mean final thoughts are just uh probably just um maybe a recommendation for uh partial my swimmers that hopefully are gonna watch that and maybe somebody else that uh my thoughts on what makes a good swimmer is uh is always a good learner there is some exceptions, but most of the time you should be able to learn and uh, learn by yourself without a coach repeating it to you multiple times. Uh, so you, you, the ability to learn is crucial to, to a fast swimming. So you have to apply those little details and new knowledge that you receive from a coach or wherever the video you watched, you have to apply it. And uh, it's, it's physical, but, you know, that's the nature of the sport. It's still a learning process. So I just, that, that's my recommendation. Be a student of the sport and try to learn every day. Uh, and uh, don't have just times as your goals. Have also some technical detail that you want to improve as, a, as your goal. Doesn't matter for a particular training, uh, day or just as a end of the year goal. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.